Howdy, I'm here at Casablanca Bed and Breakfast in San Antonio, New Mexico with my old friend Phil Norton, greatest ever refuge manager in the system. And my friend Anita North is here. And every time I come, I stayed away from Bosque for a few years, but I've been down here. I think this is 25 years since I first came. And whenever I come, I stop by to chat with Phil because he's such a sweet, nice man. It's a pleasure to meet you, really. Arthur spoke so lovingly of you since I, because he had stopped coming to Bosque when I met him, and now this is sort of his return voyage here. Yeah. So he was so looking forward yeah. to seeing you. And I'm very interested in wildlife refugees because we don't have them in Canada. So I'd love to hear how you, how you joined and how these oh. how this operates. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, I was raised on a cotton farm in Texas, and I thought I was going to be a farmer because I wanted to be outdoors. But and I farmed for three years after I got out of high school. But then looking around, I realized <clears throat> I didn't have the money to get into it and I was going to be a tenant farmer and I didn't see much future in that. And then one day I like to tell people I had my epiphany. I was driving an old John Deere tractor and it's before you had a cab and air conditioning and I was cultivating cotton and it was in July and a jet plane went overhead and I kept watching that jet plane thinking you know the people in that plane is going to go do something a whole lot more interesting today than I'm going to do. Back and forth cultivating cotton. So I made up my mind I was going to go to college and do something interesting with my life. So when I went to the house that night, I told my dad, I'm not going to be a cotton farmer. And he supported me because he was trapped on the farm. Yeah. So I got my crop out, sold my equipment, loaded everything I owned in the back end of a pickup and moved to Texas Tech and majored in range management. The only thing I needed to do is to go to work for the Forest Service as a range con, but That's I'd be a, a range conservationist, you know, or BLM or something mm -hmm. like that. While I was there, Texas Tech started a degree in wildlife management. So I switched over to wildlife. And actually, I'm the first person to graduate from Texas Tech with a degree in wildlife management. Now, this would be very interesting to know. What year was that? 1968. So at that time, what were the big were there big wildlife concerns? Like now we know oh, yeah, that there's you know, There's ones, always, you know, issues. You know. What were they then? Oh, I don't know. You know, yeah, just uh, loss of habitat. We were trying to acquire refuges. Uh, you had, you know, different issues, but essentially the same as what we always face. Uh, funding, lack of manpower, you know. Anyway, I lucked out and I got a job. I'm not a veteran. And there was veterans' preference, you know, with Vietnam veterans and all. But I was able to get a job at Buffalo Lake Refuge, which is in the Texas Panhandle, south of Amarillo. Uh, we had, I was the president of the Wildlife Club, and we invited the refuge manager from Buffalo Lake to come down and talk to the Wildlife Club. And, and after his talk, he was... Uh, he was... Uh, standing around talking and we're eating donuts and drinking coffee. And because uh, uh, I started, I was graduating, I was graduating from um, college and I was contacting agencies and everybody said, well, we're not hiring. Yeah. So you know, I was talking to the manager, Gordon Henson, and I said, what is this? I'm fixing to graduate and everybody tells me there's no jobs. He looked at me a minute and said, do you want a job? I said, yeah. He said, how proud are you? And I, said, I don't know. Uh, he said, well, I've got a GS4 biological aid. It's a 700-hour appointment for the summer. Oh, biological aid. I haven't seen them, you know, out bending. Wildlife. Wildlife biological aid. Biological aid, okay. Yeah, yeah. I could see myself out bending birds or whatever, you know. I said, well, what are the duties involved? And he said, well, it's selling the gate tickets, Golden Eagle Passport, and cleaning restrooms and campgrounds. And oh, okay. I said, how long do I have to think about it? And he said, two minutes. Because if you don't take it, 
I'm going to walk out here and I'm going to offer it to somebody else tomorrow. And I said, I'll take it. So I'll, that's how I started. And I'd walk around with <laughs> picking up garbage and cleaning restrooms, thinking, gee, it took a college degree so I could do this. And <laughs> But then my point was about to end, and I got a phone call from a personnel office saying, we have a refuge manager trainee at Wichita Mountains. Do you want it? Yeah. Where is it? <laughs> it's in Oklahoma, near Lawton. And I got in the door as a trainee. And then... And I thought it was great, you know, the government offer uh, uh, me a position in Colorado, you know, different locations. And, and how'd you wind up at Bosque, Phil? Okay, I, I, uh, I had uh, left the field and I'd gone into an administrative office uh, in uh, Phoenix, where I was in charge of the refuges in Utah, and, I mean, uh, Arizona and New Mexico. So I'd come over to Bosque. So I was familiar with Bosque. And uh, then I thought the road to happiness was up the ladder. So I had a chance to go into Washington. Uh, and I served in the catacombs there in a staff position. And then later in uh, the late 70s, I moved to Denver, where I was a supervisor of the refuges in Utah, Colorado, and Kansas. One day I came down to a meeting in Albuquerque and after the meeting, several of us drove down to Bosque to see the geese. All I could see was how the refuge had literally gone to hell in a handbasket. Um, the headquarters looked abandoned. If you, where you drive in the entrance, everything to the south was completely abandoned. It was salt cedar. All of the irrigation ditches were completely choked in vegetation and beaver dams. I was just appalled at what had happened. And uh, the manager at that time was a Vietnam veteran and he had post-traumatic syndrome. And he had tend to hide in his office behind his computer. And he finally got in trouble with everybody, including our regional director who finally had it with him. What year was that? About? Was, uh, in, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 86. And uh, they moved him to a position that he was more suited for. And I lobbied to come down here because I had ideas that I felt like a manager should have. But I, I had never been in charge of my own refuge. I'd always been an assistant. So it's kind of like being in the Navy and never having your own boat. So I lobbied to come here. I was willing to take a downgrade to, to come. So uh, <laughs> the, the regional director had been a nuclear submarine commander before he joined the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I knew him some, but he didn't know me. So I came down and interviewed, and we hit it off. And he said, well, I think you can do. You'll do, so you can go to Bosque. They didn't advertise it. I just took a downgrade and moved to it. And uh, he said, just keep in mind, I want Bosque to be a show place. And I said, well, that's no trouble, as long as you keep in mind show places don't come cheap. You can't just change the players and, and, and throw them in the ring unless you're willing to follow through with cold hard cash and warm bodies. And he said, well, I can help you, but as a manager, that's up to you to figure out how to make that happen. And then we talked and he said, well, when you get down, what do you think your biggest problem will be? And I said, you will be. Because, and he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? I said, you're too deeply involved. Tell me what you want and give me a long leash. If I can't do what you want, talk to me. Yeah. If, I, if I can't do it, then move me, but give me a long leash. And now, he what did. what were the state of the birds at that time? Were there a lot well, of birds? Well, the, the goose population was increasing, <coughs> and there were a lot of birds, oh. but they were all on that one pond right there at the flight deck, because that was about the only wetland we had. So it was a very established place for them to feed naturally without a reserve? They used to just... Well, my first winter here, I'd been here about three weeks or four, you know, something like that. And my phone rang and it was a farmer up here. Uh, and the conversation started like, Phil, I want you to get your goddamn creams out of my goddamn corn before I kill the goddamn things. So I went up to talk to him and his name is Gary Perry. 
he had uh, you know, like a hundred acres of corn that he had planted late in the season. We had an early snowfall. He tried to harvest it, but he had more corn laying on the ground than we did on the refuge. And he had about 2,000 cranes, and he could not chase them out of that field. And I said, Gary, I'd like to help you, but there's nothing I can do. We don't have any food on the refuge. And he said, what would you do if I went to town and bought 500 cows and turned them out here on the land and I ran out of food, so I turned them in on the refuge? What would you tell me? And I said, well, I'd tell you to get your cows off the refuge. There's your birds. I want them off my refuge. And uh, so right after that, Congressman Skeen, who was an old Republican from farmer rancher from southern New Mexico, we'd had a redistricting and we'd gone into his district. And he came up on a tour, and we rode around, and we hit it off. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm going to be in the state for a couple of weeks. So I'm getting a lot of phone calls, people complaining about the birds from Bosque. So he said, why don't you get all the farmers together, and I'll come back, and I want to hear them. And I was kind of laughing, and I said, you want me to get everybody that's upset with me, <laughs> and you're going to come in and listen to them? Do I give them a stick to hit me over the head when they come in? And he said, you just get them together. I'll handle the farmers. So we had about 50 farmers there in our conference room. They all vented about, yeah, you know, and they, they had legitimate problems. And uh, Skeen listened to it, and he said, okay, I understand. You know, there's problems. What are we going to do about it? And part of it is we were passive in our assistance. Farmers would c complain about the birds, and we'd just give them a bunch of fireworks to throw at, the, throw at them, you know. And the cranes, just, it, it was not effective. So we ended, a uh, scheme ended up appropriating $60,000 a year. They threw, you threw firecrackers at the birds to scare them off. Yeah, yeah. Bottle, you know, bottle rockets, you know, things like that to try to scare them out they of They were protected under the Migratory Bird Act at that time. Yeah, oh yeah, they were. Okay. They were not killing them. They weren't. But they were scaring them out. You know, you have the right to scare things off your, you know, this property. cause them property. You know. And uh, so we hired, he appropriated $60,000 a year, uh, and we got it. And we had hired two people. That was their job, was to be very proactive in scaring cranes. So whenever somebody had a problem, uh, they could call these guys, and they'd go out there quite aggressively and chase them. But it didn't take the cranes long to realize these guys were shooting blanks. So they didn't get much uh, uh, well, respect. They'd run around the fields on, on machines or tractors or M what? Mostly, just, just mostly the same thing, shooting yeah. uh, cracker shells and bottle rockets. and we'd, They'd set up silvery things that would, you know, kind of like scarecrows. But it didn't if take you a, did that now, you'd be in jail, wouldn't no, you? No, 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 no. You, 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 have the right, you have the right to protect your property. You don't have the right to kill them, but you, you can, you know, oh. harass them off your property. And, uh, but there's, uh, there's actually a hunting season on cranes. Yeah, and, and uh, because they're trying to keep this population, which is a Rocky Mountain population of the greater Sandhill Cranes, at 20,000 birds, plus or minus 10%. If the population decreases, well, the best tool for managing it uh, is, is hunting. You know, and so each state is given so many permits, like 50 or 60 permits, to harvest. If it goes above 20,000, if it gets 24,000, they can increase permits to keep the crane population at that level, because that's kind of what the habitat can carry and I had a problem with that because to me it's, a, it's immoral to kill a crane but I can't allow my personal feelings interfere with my management responsibilities and there's no biological reason why you can't hunt a crane there may be a moral issue but it's not a biological reason so anyway if a farmer wanted our assistance he had to agree to allow hunting on his land so if a hunter got a permit and wanted to know where to go, we'd put him in touch with these guys that were chasing cranes. So they'd put them out there in the field and when the cranes came out, they got shot at and they'd leave. So when these 
animal damage control guys would go back out the next day when they drove in the field the cranes were gone so we were estimating there was probably in excess of a hundred thousand dollars a year to farmers crops in the immediate area after that it went to zero uh, there was hardly any damage on so a hundred thousand dollars of damage to the crops yes yes how many uh, seasons did it take for the cranes to figure this out and associate the gun with that oh it didn't vehicle? take it didn't take two days you know, I mean, they, they learned right away, you know, that smart. there were actually people out mm -hmm. there shooting at them. And when somebody approached them out there, now it's kind of funny, those same birds could come back here and land right next to where you're standing, but they know here it's okay. Yeah. It's a refuge. Mm -hmm. And uh, they know where people belong. You know. Right. So anyway, that's, I'm not sure how I got off on all of this. Uh, on the hunting, but uh, anyway, I, I was able to come here to Bosque, and I had a long leash, and but Domen Senator Domenici was our senator, and he was a head of the Senate Budget Committee, which made him a very key person, and Skeen was a chairman of the House Appro Agriculture Appropriation Committee, which made him a key person. And he, they could both look at Bosque as a green issue that they could support because it wasn't like a tackling grazing on public lands. And Domenici had an initiative to try to keep the river, the Bosque, the Rio Grande corridor, green. And we were doing a lot of work on riparian restoration and wetland restoration. And we got, we got political support. Uh, we got good funding. How successful was that to keep that river system? I'm sorry? How successful was that to protect, uh, have a green belt along the Rio Grande? Well, Has it, you know, the whole... It's worked? Well, you know, historically, you have to, you know, the Rio Grande riparian corridor is like two miles wide. And historically, the river had the entire river corridor to roam around in. And in the springtime, there'd be a rainfall event or a rapid snow melt, and the river would absolutely go on a rampage. It would be banked, you know, two mile wide river just tearing everything up. And then when it went back down, it would have new river channels, uh, leave the old channels behind as an oxbow lake. And that's what perpetuated the cottonwoods and willows was the flooding. And so you had a lot of habitat it was kind of lower quality, but it was a lot of it, so the birds were all distributed around. Then when man came in in the 1800s, they started damming and diverting the water, building levees to keep the river confined to a very small sh corridor, and it completely broke the hydrologic cycle that maintained all of this area. In other words, all of these lands out here are, are isolated from the river. And then with the invasion of exotics like salt cedar and Russian olive and all of this, and those are self-perpetuating because they're fire tolerant, whereas the native vegetation is not as fire tolerant. So there'd be a fire, either man caused or lightning fire or whatever, and it would uh, suppress cottonwood and willows. And with the uh, salt cedar here, every time you'd have a fire, there'd be more salt cedar and less natives. Till after all time, it's just a monotypic stand of salt cedar, and it's essentially uh, a biological desert compared to the, what, you know, the natural vegetation. So we started a program trying to figure out how to control salt cedar and restore the natives. Also, uh, if you irrigate a place like Bosque, you're flooding it, and you have to have it so the water can percolate through the soil profile and then seep out. So you're leaching your salts out. Well, the uh, interior, you have to have a drain. A drain is like a hole in a flower pot. Mm. Everybody knows what's happened if you have a potted plant and without a hole in the bottom and you water it, it becomes waterlogged and the plant dies. That's what was happening to Bosque. So our farmlands were so alkali, we couldn't, we could produce maybe I called it four and forty. It was, 
They were four feet tall, four feet apart, and 40 bushels an acre. So you couldn't control the feeding. When the birds got here, they just walked out in the cornfield and ate all their food. And by December, they were out of food, so they started going on private land. So the first thing we did was that big drain. When you first come in the entrance, there's a big drain there. That's the hole in the flower pot. Oh. And the bottom of that drain was probably three feet higher than it is now. So it did not serve as a drain. And uh, we had a little custom on Friday afternoons. We'd quit 30 minutes early and a lot of the crew would gather out behind the tractor shed with a couple of six packs. And the guy from the reclamation office was here and he said, you know, I think that interior drain would qualify for a project for the Interstate Stream Commission to fund. The Interstate Stream Commission is a, is a state organization involved in, because there's a compact between Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado on how the Rio Grande water will be divided. And so the Interstate Stream Commission was looking for water to send to Texas to help do compact. And we had all this water locked up on the refuse. So we went up to Santa Fe and presented the project. And the Interstate Stream Commission gave the Bureau of Reclamation a million dollars to rehab that 13 miles of ditch. And I loved it because here's Reclamation out with their excavators and bulldozers and their men and dump trucks. And they spent like two years cleaning that. What year was that? It was in probably the late 80s, 88, 89, something like that. So you were able to decrease the salt content in the soil and get Well, that dropped yields. the bottom of the ditch. Yeah. And matter of fact, there was so much water, it's just like springs, flowing into that lower ditch that you couldn't maintain the sides of your canal. They keep slipping off. But anyway, they dropped it, and that was the key for turning the refuge around because what that led to being able to grow we could grow more. better crops yeah. and so then, how do you move the water now between the areas Is well there, you, you have canals and uh, water controlled structures and and those decisions are made based on the salinity of the of the ground yeah and you try to flush you know ah. and we completely rebuilt the water delivery system everything had been just allowed to get deteriorate to the point they were not working. And we did it ourselves. I was able to hire some key people. And they were not, it's not rocket science, you know, water flows downhill. So it's a matter of, you know, anyway, we, we, we used to laugh, we wouldn't let one of our engineers from the regional office on the refuse, because we told them we wanted the water on the right side of the dam. And, and uh, we just did it ourselves. So you were able to grow more crops and keep the cranes on the refuge, yeah. and so less of them got and we shot. had some, We had some terrible farmers, yes. and we had a couple of good ones, so I dropped the terrible ones and gave the good ones more land. And we operated on the idea, I know they're there for one reason, and that's to grow alfalfa to make money. But they have to understand the only reason we have them here is so they can grow us corn. And that's their payment to us, is growing corn for us. And if they can grow us corn and grow good alfalfa, then we're all happy. And they were good farmers. You, you could do it with a handshake. You know, sit down at the breakfast table and drink mm. coffee and convince them why it's in their best interest to farm on the refuge. So how much of the refuge was farmed? There's a, there, was a, there was around 1,500 acres. Oh, and... Uh, then we started, uh, John Taylor, that was a biologist here, uh, we, uh, we, had a, we had a college degree, but we didn't know anything about managing wetlands in an environment like this. And uh, so we invited a guy from University of Missouri, Lee Fredrickson, who was the guru on wetland management. Like him. And he came over to teach a workshop here. And then he and John became good friends and he became John's mentor. <coughs> And we had graduate students over here all the time from the University of Missouri doing work on wetland management. So it was a, you know, it was it was a fun, fun time. Yeah, it's very interesting. At, at what point, Phil, did the volunteer program start? Well, uh, they had one couple that had tried to volunteer here before I came, but they were not allowed to stay on the refuge, so they camped up here at the 
Bosky Bird Watchers RV Park. He is a retired chemi chemistry professor and his wife from the University of New Hampshire. So when I came, Charlie and Katie wanted to come back. So we put them in a store. It was a, a, a warehouse that had a little uh, office with a heater and kind of a kitchen. So we put cots up in there. So they stayed at least in a building with heat. And it dawned on me, if, if a manager wants to come close to doing the job that needs to be done, there's never enough money or manpower to do what you need to do. So you have to look at non-traditional ways to try to get it done. And so we started the volunteer program and we started advertising and the work camper news, which is a magazine for RVers. Right. And we'd ever put it up in, you know, or, or do you want to get out of Wisconsin for the winter? You know, come to beautiful, warm New Mexico. Yeah? And uh, we put in five RV hookups and we filled them. We put in five more RV. We ended up putting 25 RV hookups for just volunteers. And uh, then we had a kitchen. We called it the Bosque Lounge. And uh, so they could have parties there. And they developed a whole little community, you know, Spanish lessons and dancing lessons and computer lessons, you know, just among the volunteers. So, uh, we started recruiting people that I couldn't begin to, to hire, but they'd work for you for nothing if you gave them a good job, mm -hmm. leeway in how the job was done, and then showed your appreciation. So we had a lot of parties and awards and things like that. Uh, Were they also people that loved nature, that loved the cranes? Was, oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's quite that's beautiful. a big this part of it. But we had a lot of retired equipment operators that, didn't want to go back and work, but they liked to work for a couple of months, you know, and, and work. Then you had a lot of wannabes, retired attorneys and, and doctors that always wanted to run heavy equipment. And we had a guy on our staff that was a trainer, certified to train. So we could put them through a week long training course, we're watching movies and workbooks, and then we'd put seat time. Uh, and I have so many, we had one guy, uh, he looked like Colonel Sanders, a little short, heavy set, long white hair, looked like Colonel Sanders. He'd been a helicopter pilot, he'd been a corporate jet pilot, he had been worked in the mines in West Virginia, he'd been the sheriff of Harlan County, Kentucky, which is all the moonshiners. So here, here's this guy, such a colorful guy. And uh, so he knew equipment, so we put him to work right. because he said, Phil, don't retire if you think you're going to spend all your time fishing because if that's all you do, it gets boring as hell. So he said, I get bored of fishing and I want to work a little bit. So he'd call me, uh, do you have some room? Yeah. So he'd show up, he'd work for three months, and then he'd say, well, I'm ready to go back to fishing. Wow. But he was a great you know, asset. And our crew accepted people like that coming in. And we have so many stories of people... Uh, so what are the what is the state of the the reserve at this point? Like you're retired now for a while, are you still actively? No, I, I, well, I was here too long. The let let me you break in here for a second. Yeah. So Phil was here, the moist soil management stuff. The place was filled with bird. I always felt that Phil could move the birds around like pieces on a chessboard. So when the festival of the cranes came. And you, you were instrumental in starting that, Phil? Yeah. So yeah. Phil started the Festival of the Cranes. The only festival I know of before the Festival of the Cranes was the Cape May Spring Roundup and the Fall Roundup at Cape May Bird Observatory. Now, if you look at the calendar, you can find three festivals for birds and nature every week throughout the country. So Phil is pretty much responsible for that. And when I'm bragging on him, I'm telling people that he started the volunteer program here and that became a model for the rest of the, the refuge system well to some yeah. degree yes to some degree so anyway phil went up to klamath my understanding is that there were some problems with indian art and a bunch of people wanted to kill each other and since phil was such a good manager of people they sent him up there to quell the fires and 
Bosky had a, a succession of managers after that, who I won't name. I don't know most of the names. And conditions at the refuge started to deteriorate for photography, for visitors, to the point that after coming for about 20 years in a row, I got tired of going to the crane pool in the morning, photographing, driving around the refuge and not seeing one bird, no corn, no crops, no birds, no blast-offs, that I finally out of disgust quit. Now, in the interim, I, I founded a volunteer program that ran for two or three years where a bunch, about eight or ten folks came out in October and worked hard to open up some viewing windows. When Phil was here, the ditches were always mowed and you had clear views of the places where the birds would be. So finally out of disgust, I said, I'm not coming. I love the place. It's one of my soul places, but I give up. And then I heard that last year there were lots of birds. And the other day I asked Phil what happened, and you mentioned a 15-year-old guy. So if you could tell us that story, okay. that would be great. Okay. Oh, well, let me kind of go back. Kind of That's go fine. back a little bit, you know, is I was very pro-public use. And John Taylor, that was a biologist here, he was kind of like a typical biologist. He had been happy to lock the gate and just have the wildlife here totally, you know, on their own. But we'd get money together and, you know, he would get money from the friends and from the foundation and from uh, Ducks Unlimited. And we'd get two or three hundred thousand dollars to do a wetland rehab. And I'd say, John, where is the public use back? public use aspects of this project because I said the American public just gave you three hundred thousand dollars to do a wetland project so how are they going to enjoy their investment I said I can't go down to the Lions Club and talk about how great it is out there guys trust me you have to see it you have to be a part of it so John would would argue around and I say well okay let me put it the, this way there's gonna be a public use aspect for this project if you don't plan it, I will. So who do you want planning it? And John, uh, toward the latter part of his uh, life or career here, he died when he was 49 years old from a stroke. But he got very good at, at, at developing public use because he realized if he wanted to get another project, people had to see what happened with the first one. So he got very good at doing that. And... Uh, uh, then the other thing, we had we had a volunteer that used he had uh, Parkinson's, and he was a foreman for a construction company in, in Santa Fe. But he was real active at Hawks Aloft and you know environmental issues. So he'd come down to Bosque for R and R, and he'd go out on the tour road and he'd see he set up his spotting scope and he'd see a crane or an eagle or something you know, and he'd wave cars down, and do you want to see it? So I'd get letters from people saying, I was down at the refuge and I was having a good time and then I met Robert and he made my visit. Now I accused him of writing letters and telling them when they get back to New York, send this letter to Phil, you know. What was his last name, Phil? Robert Cuttenauer. And he was here for years. I remember him well. So we finally gave him emblems to put on his car and a easel. You know, roving biologist, do you want to see the crane? You know, so people would know who they were being accosted by. And he, then I gave him the job of figuring out how to make the refuge more viewer friendly. In other words, you drive along and it's just like a, a, a you know, a tree row. You can't see anything. And he'd say, you know, if, I, if we cut a window here, there's a little wetland over there. And then if we put some logs in there, there'd be a, place for turtles to bask on and waterfowl to sit on. So he'd go out and tie ribbons and then he'd find somebody with a mower and he'd mow uh, windows. And that really, you know, and, you know, he, the crew is always complaining about Robert dragging them out, and, you know, showing them where he wanted to mow. And uh, so, uh, not forgetting my point at this point. Where, where was I going with that? Uh, talking about making the place more viewer friendly 
Okay. And yeah. going back. And then I'm going to interject here yeah. one thing. I've always seen Phil as just an incredible manager and incredibly innovative. So, I don't know, 15 years ago, I went in and I said, Phil, you got these this beautiful deck and the cranes are landing in the field and you got these horrible, I don't know if they were power lines or telephone lines, power lines. Yeah. Elevated power lines on poles and it's really ugly at the refuge and it's terrible for photography. You're right on a crane flying in, parachuting down right into an east wind in the morning and all of a sudden you got this power line. I come back, I think it was within a year and... There's no power lines. I said, Phil, what did you do? Cut down the power lines? He said, no, we asked the power company about uh, getting rid of the power lines. And they said, well, that's much too expensive. We'll never do it. Uh, and they had to replace, my, my understanding is that they had to replace the lines. So Phil went to some auction and bought on the cheap the the no, let, let me clarify that. Okay, because I'm I'm making up stories, but I'd love well, to hear it from the you're, you're kind of, from the horse's mouth. You're partially true. Um, we had three power lines running down the highway. We had a telephone line. We had electric line to the refuge headquarters, and we had an electric line for the railroad to operate their crossings. And. Uh, I knew the engineer for the electric co-op, and uh, I saw him one evening in town, and he said, uh, we've got old power lines falling apart, so we're going to replace it. And I said, well, why don't you uh, put it underground? And he said, well, to do what we want to do is going to cost us 350000 uh, to do what you want to do is going to be 500000 So give us 150000 and we'll put it underground. And I said, Richard, I don't have 150000 So we talked about it a little bit, and I said, well, will you accept in-kind services for our contribution? Uh, the proposal was that they would buy the supplies, which was around 300000 and we would do the work. And uh, I went to the electric co-op and met with the board, and they agreed to it because they felt like the refuge was trying to be a part of the community. Interesting. So yeah. we drew up a simple little memorandum of understanding that was a, a essentially an agreement between Luke Vega, the manager of the co-op, and myself that we were going to put this power line on the ground. Any attorney, if they had looked at it, they would have had a heart attack. But it was an agreement. And I have shaken my hands, and we did it. And I rented a big trencher. I borrowed equipment from White Sands to carry the big spools of the, of the cable. I rec recruited a guy from that was a retired electrical contractor from uh, Oregon. And we put together a crew of volunteers with one of our guys overseeing the actual work. And they had laid in the ground and put all the junction boxes in and then the co-op technician would come out and look at it and do the actual connection and then bless it and we'd cover it up. And we had 15 miles of power line running all through the refuge and we got it, uh, we reduced it to 12 miles by realigning it and we got all the power lines on the ground. And uh, uh, I, I tried to give the electric co-op a lot of uh, recognition, we wrote articles in their newspaper and all, that government agencies can work together if you have a, a, a similar goal and a level of trust. So we got it all put underground. The only thing we really had to buy, they didn't have the equipment to detect underground problems because they didn't have any underground power lines. And to buy the equipment was going to be 25000 Now. They could have bought it, but they wanted a show of faith, and they wanted me to buy it. And I said, well, I can't buy equipment and give it to you, but I can buy equipment and loan it to you. And they probably still, they probably still have it. <laughs> but anyway, that was a, a show of faith. On, on so there were no legal ob uh, uh, 
obstacles to doing this? Well, because you, know, you think of all the what, regulations around co codes for electrical anything. Yeah, That's well, amazing. That we knew what codes were, and, and so we did it according to code. And oh. then by leaving it open, their person responsible for that could come out and look and say, "Yeah, it's code." So yeah, so we met that. We didn't do a flubbing out outfit, you know. And uh, so um, anyway, we got it all underground. And uh, but I guess that's where I I, I I need too many managers that would sit back and wait for somebody to give them a million dollars to do a project. Yeah. To me, the the art, the art of the deal, is uh, knowing how to get somebody uh, to do something you want. You know, and, and by working together. So, uh, and I work. What I wanted to do when I moved here, to me, Bosky was this gray, faceless bureaucratic entity, kind of like the IRS. It, it, we were the duck refuge out here. And uh, there was no involvement with the refuge and the local community. People would come out here, they'd serve their tour, they'd leave, nobody knew them, nobody cared. There was just no, no involvement. I wanted to put color in faces. Uh, I wanted the guys that go down to the cafe in the morning and talk about things. I didn't want them to go into refuge and say, you know what that fool is doing now? I want to pick up the phone and say, Phil, what in the hell are you doing? Yeah. You know, there's a difference. And uh, so I tried to make sure, or encourage, let's put it that way, everybody to get involved in something. It might be the rodeo association. Uh, I was on the board for the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I was active in lines. Then had another thing, is never start a new project on fr Friday at noon, get out. You know. And my management style is managing by wandering around. So, uh, and I like to hop rate equipment, so I'd go out and find a bulldozer that wasn't being operated and I'd get on the bulldozer and work with the crew. Because if you wait for them to come in your office and tell you what's bothering them, that will never happen. But if you go out and work with a crew, you get dirty, you're servicing it, uh, go to your pickup and mm. get a cold beer and sit down in the shade. That's, you know, something's been bothering me. I've been, I've been why has this been happening? So, so you talk. What happened then that, going back to Arthur's comment, uh, uh, the 15 year old that. Okay, how, well, he wasn't, he looked how, 15. He was. 25 or whatever like but how he, did he look a young like, he looked like a kid yeah. did the reserve take another dip down yeah, did yeah. something what happened well um there was one year after i left and went to klamath there was a drought and the river was going dry and there's an endangered little fish the real grand silvery minnow and there was uh, the river was going dry so there was threatened lawsuits over the issue and our regional director made the decision to take the refuge water and leave it in the river to keep the river wet. For and this that didn't fish? exactly help the farmers out. Yeah, and, and somebody pointed out, well, we have farmers that have an agreement. What's, what about them? Well, we'll just pay them for their loss. So it was, a, it was an attempt to protect the fish? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it wasn't a mindless bureaucratic follow-up. It was... There was well, good in my intent. mind, it was a mindless bureaucratic. <laughs> I was setting yeah, you up you for that. Yeah, you don't. Take, you don't. <laughs> you there's don't, other I know. ways to solve the problem yeah. than, than destroying the refuge. Yeah. So, anyway. What year? Sorry, was that? That was drought? probably. Uh, uh, it's probably 2000, 2001, something like that. Uh, and so th there was some compensation given the farmers, but then they said, "We're out of here. We're not going to farm like this. We can't do this." So then the refuge. Would, post a notice in the paper or at the post office say, we're looking for co-op farmers on the refuge. Well, nobody would respond, except somebody up in Berlin that come down and say, yeah, I can do it. And they'd come down and they'd grow, they'd give them a kiss and a promise and then they were gone. Hmm. And they could grow alfalfa, but they couldn't grow corn, you know, all of this. So they, the refuge would drop them. What but, was there about growing corn? It's more difficult? It cost, cost them money. 
and the, the corn was ours. They could grow what they were harvesting, but they couldn't grow what we... So they'd have to buy the seed for it. Well, it wasn't that. They just didn't try to grow corn. They, they were... So shy. they... they, they were, were, could they, care less. Yeah, they uh, broke the deal, though. They're on the refuge with the understanding that they yeah, get the alfalfa yeah. and the cranes Yeah, but get the good farmers had already left because they got screwed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I got upset because you're not going to get somebody. Because when I got back, so I, I knew a couple of good farmers here, and I went up and asked them, how come you won't bid? And he said, would you put your livelihood in their hands? No, because this is big money. If you're farming 500 acres, you've got to go to the bank and get a half million dollar loan. Well, the bank's not going to give you money. If you don't have insurance, they're going to be able to get their money back. So uh, nobody, so the last manager, Kevin Cobble, made the decision and this is when they were trying to figure out what to do. And I didn't think that the refuge could do what we call force account farming. In other words, with refuge staff farming. Uh, because I, I thought what we had with the alfalfa, with the alfalfa and with the corn, it was a good rotation. You know, five, six years of alfalfa, two years of corn, you rotate it. And we could get... 250, 300 acres of corn produced essentially at no cost. But it took a lot of land and it took a lot of water to grow that alfalfa. So Kevin made the decision when this assistant, Shane, and then one of the maintenance guys here, Calvin Reeves, was born. What here. was Shane's last name? I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, uh, they came in and said, we'd like to try farming. And if you'll leave us alone and let us farm, we'll do it. And Kevin did. Because you can't work five days a week, eight hours a day. When it's time to farm, you got to farm. So they farmed. Hmm. And they did a beautiful job growing corn. You know, like 140, 150 bushel an acre of corn. Well, of course, all the alfalfa fields just kind of grew weeds. And... That kind of, kind of bothered me, being a farmer, seeing a weedy farm field. But anyway, they had, all of a sudden, they had their cranes and geese, goose populations. And then they started experimenting with other crops to build up the nitrogen, you know, different cover crops that they could plant that didn't take out the water that would build up the nitrogen. Then they found this kind of a hybrid grain called trichocale that kind of the geese and the cranes. Love. They just leave it in the field, and it takes very little water. And uh, so now then, uh, Shane has moved, but then they have Calvin, and then they hire a local guy here that's a wonderful individual. And they're, the two of them are farming, and they're doing a great job. And the advantage of that, it, during the summer, there's a lot of competition for water. So all of a sudden, instead of trying to irrigate 1,500 acres, they're irrigating two or 300. So they have water to do, more water to do wetland management. Or, you know, there's this competition. So on that account, I, I was wrong. And I think that what Kevin did was a really good move. Well, we're going to finish up by saying I'm glad things worked out. I know you're happy as could be here turning your bowls. Yeah, in the shop. <laughs> well, I used and, uh, to, I used to get so upset when regular guests here they'd go down to the refuge, and they'd come back and say, "What's going on?" And I'd always make an excuse, you know, bad money, bad water. Finally, I got to the point saying, "Incompetent management." That's mm -hmm. all it was, and. I, went to, I, went, I was first on that bandwagon, and I got well, in big trouble for that. I knew that supervisor in Albuquerque, and I went up and said, we need to do lunch. I said, I didn't come back here to get involved in trying to manage Bosque, but I'm sitting here watching it go into hell in a handbasket. I said, to me, your job is to support the managers and to make sure the managers do their job. So what if, do you if think? You, if you sorry. have a manager that is not doing their job and you continue to let them, you're not doing your job. Yes. I'd really like to know how you feel about the future, like even past our lifetimes. Like what what do you think are the what are the things that need to keep happening 
to keep this place for the next generation and the generation after because there's always going to be the stress of money, politics, the river, the Rio Grande, the water mm -hmm. levels. Like, well, how do we maintain places like this as a... Well, yeah. Okay, what? the pendulum swings back and forth. Yes. Uh, the way the pendulum is swinging right now with the Republicans and under Trump, who I think are just unmitigated disasters, anything environmentally. And to me, Trump came in with the idea, and the Republicans, you know, small government, and, you know, the problem is the government, is they have painted the government as being incompetent. And look at the people they have appointed to head it up, like Zinke, you know, mm -hmm. Interior Secretary. Our, uh, you know, you go down the list. Every secretary has been anti the department that they're placed there to manage. So to me, they're making the government incompetent, which means people don't mind when you get rid of it. And so with that mindset, right now I'm very pessimistic. But I also know that sooner or later the pendulum is going to swing back the other way. And we'll be taking care of their resources rather than exploiting them. So anyway. Well, I hope you're right. Because it's a <laughs> Phil great... Phil Norton, I would like yeah. to thank you for your time. This was an absolute pleasure for me. And I hope that this thing was actually recording. And we get to share it with <laughs> well, some I, folks. I, I love it when somebody comes in and kind of... Tell me about your career, you know, so I guess sit here I and know. just talk. I didn't know he was going to be recording I it. I was surprised. I, didn't I, didn't I just either. wanted to hear about yeah. Yes. Well, God bless and yes. thanks so yeah. much. Yeah. 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 yeah.